Hello, welcome again to uh, OWF Web TV 2012. We're here with uh, Rob Van Cranenberg. Welcome, Rob. Thank you. We're glad uh, to have you here. Very happy to be here. So uh, you run the Internet of Things EU Council site. Could you tell us a little bit more what it what it is? Yes, we we set it up uh, around uh, 2009 um, when we realized that that Internet of Things was going to be the winning term for what we see that is happening all around us, which is a huge convergence of connectivity between people, things, animals, places, um, and basically the, the idea is that somehow everything will can be connected to everything, which is a very strange, strange idea actually. But it seems to take off and in itself it's not so new. There's a lot of work being done on ubiquitous computing, on pervasive computing, on ambient intelligence, on things that think, the disappearing computer. But it's basically all about this same thing about merging the real world with the digital world to create some kind of new virtual entities that you can then also talk to or approach that then will also have some effect in the real world. Now this is an operation that is, is so in itself not new, but it's now known as the Internet of Things. It's a term that was launched in the US, then picked up in Eu Europe, and also very much so in China. It was named by the Chinese Premier as the, one of the key focus research points, and there's a lot of money being invested at the moment in China and Internet of Things. And it's also being picked up now in the States. Very recently, only about two or three months, the term is being used uh, widely, and it seems to be the winner, and that's why we set up the Internet of Things.eu to be a kind of think tank for people who are want to reflect on this. And uh, for you, Internet of Things, as, as you explain it, it's very broad. So, do you have any specific area actually that you are that you are focused on, or it's as broad as it as as the term itself? I'm I'm very sort of I'm very lucky and happy in this whole space because I come from literature, <laughs> and and sort of I tell stories and I like stories, and uh, in that respect, this is uh, the biggest story since uh, the book or fire, and uh, as such, yes, we have to break it down. And you could break it down in basically technical layers, which is a body area network where a lot of data will come off your body about e-health, telling you or, or showing you things that you may want to do or not want to do. Now this has to go somewhere. It probably has to go to a home environment, which is then the um, uh, the, the sort of the, the the LAN, the local area network, where basically people realize talk about the smart meter sort of nowadays. And then also you go to your car and you want to have some kind of fluid, seamless interaction between the data coming from your body that will probably go to some gateway like a, a glasses or, or a hearing aid. Siemens, for example, is making a hearing aid that is online. So when the fire truck is in another part of town, you walk into the fire truck, you don't hear the fire truck because the hearing aid starts filtering out the fire truck and the noise before you know that there is some noise uh, around. And specifically, are you working, for example, with companies like Siemens to take this further? Or yes. Well, this is... Um, I'm a um, stakeholder coordinator for IOTA. IOTA is uh, the biggest, uh, the largest IP in uh, the European Union on Internet of Things architecture. It wants to build a reference architecture model. So not so much the best reference architecture or the best architecture, but a reference architecture model that hopefully will be picked up by lots of other architects uh, globally, as um, logically we will not have an internet of things, but intranets of things, thousands of intranets of things. And if we want to get to an internet of things, which we know from the internet as the TCP IP protocol, which sort of says we'll break down packets irresponsible, uh, sort of irrespective of whether you pay a load of money, whether you're a big guy or, or a small guy, and whether you have no money at all, your, your mail goes as fast through the net as anybody else's, that layer, that open layer, is something that we also would like to have in the real world. Now, before we can get to that, there's of course huge legacy issues and there's a huge amount of business models that are not tuned to this specific way of working. And I guess that's also the reason why we're so happy to be here at this forum, because I think this is where a kind of roadmap is made towards openness. And we, we all know we can't go from close to open in five seconds flat. Uh, but we, we must, because otherwise, and this is our message to big, gov big governments and big corporates that are basically dinosaurs, ready to break and they will break. But if they break, also the infrastructure breaks, and we want that intact. 
to build services and applications on and make money on, on, on those, and not on the backbone, not on the infrastructure. Yeah, and do you have any uh, specific roadmap? This, well, this roadmap is, uh, is something that needs to be interfaced to, uh, to, 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 to many different layers. So we have, well, unfortunately, we have a policy environment where we have politicians that do not really understand this. And if you, for example, compare it to what's going on in China, that nine out of the 11 current top politicians in China are engineers, which means that they already do an Internet of Things. So they run China like Google would run the United States. Now, this gives them a huge advantage. I'm not talking about politics here, or about, but I'm talking about the ability to steer on layers of infrastructures, services, applications, hardware, the legal context. And if you can do this in an integrated way, which they can, of course you have a huge advantage over us because we have a goal to explain to this Internet of Things to politicians. And if they get it, when they get it, they realize that they can actually go home. They are no longer needed in a kind of Internet of Things decision-making structure with huge transparency and openness, much more objective than their sort of ego politics that we, we've known for centuries. The same with civil servants. I was asked recently to uh, write a text to do an interview for the Dutch water management uh, infrastructure sort of uh, ministry. And they've, they've realized that basically Holland is now so fully surveilled with a smart grid that they can go home, and they <laughs> literally can go home. There's no more need for humans to interfere on the output of all these systems. They can run very effectively themselves. So my, sort of my, my answer to them was, they can sort of stay a little bit in their, in their sort of towers a little bit more, just a little bit, and they can then go into the requirements of the whole process. But they are no longer needed sort of at, at, the, at the outer end. But of course, this means that that they are obsolete, and they are obsolete. So basically, we are talking about an extremely disrupt disruptive uh, <laughs> process that is, that is sort of going on, that if we do not get to manage a really good balance between closed and open, a really good balance between, between really innovative thinking and um, um, thinking for society as large, then we, we're probably looking at sort of two ways in which we can go. One is that we will end up with France will have like a hundred smart cities, completely business modeled in, in a leasing way. So you basically lease your life and you pay 90% to the company setting up that gated community. You enter it and that's, that's where you, all the food is sort of you lease, you get, a, you get a fridge from somebody and you lease your food. So that's one model. But what will happen to the rest of France then? So what will happen to the rest of Europe or the world if we will have a thousand smart cities that are only made for like 50,000 rich people. And well, this will basically be sort of Mad Max in between. And so there's basically no choice but to go to a more inclusive way. And even if you would say that you don't really want this Internet of Things for privacy or security issues, it's, it's inevitable. There's no other way. And so we can, we can then only dis hopefully decide to go for a smart society for everybody. Just and hopefully uh, we will need a bit more developers and engineers and on a governmental level to get things moving uh, faster. Well, actually, I would put it a bit louder and say that engineers have to take over. It's a very, it's a very, uh, it's of course at the moment, they have to become more political. Yeah. Because, um, so, and not political in the sense of put, putting out a, an engineering party, but more political in their companies. So the, 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 the architects should be much more close to the CEOs. And it should be much more closer to decision making and budgets and, and investments uh, where things are going at the moment. Well, we wish you very good luck in your quest and thank lobbying. You. And uh, thank you very much for being with us. Well, thank you very <laughs> much for having me. Thank you.